Tell me about the building in Singapore you have that's a zero carbon footprint that actually produces more energy than it uh, than it consumes. Which building is that and, and tell me about it. Okay, uh, that building is called the Zero Energy Building and it's built at the BCA Academy. It's a retrofitted four-story building that, um, I'm sorry, it's a retrofitted three-story building and uh, we literally looked at uh, making that building um, as efficient as possible in terms of utilities, water, electricity, and it started start to put uh, renewable energies inside uh, with photovoltaic cells. For example, we have three gen first generation, second generation, and third generation photovoltaic cells. Uh, we have green walls, we have uh, solar assisted uh, stack ventilation, we have light tubes that uh, bring in light from the outside to almost 8 to 12 meters into the building. And uh, <clears throat> you know there are a lot of uh, new technologies that uh, have been introduced in that building. There's over a thousand meter squares of uh, photovoltaic cells on the roof. And uh, we, also, we are also experimenting on vertical uh, third generation uh, photovoltaic cells. Uh, well, they are films actually pasted on the balustrades. Uh, and um, basically that building uh, is supposed to be a zero energy building. But what I understand now is it's a plus energy building because it's producing more energy than it, uh, it, it consumes. What will it take to make a truly carbon neutral building a reality? Are we close? No, uh, we're, we're not close yet because I, I believe that there are still um, uh, a lot of, uh, to do. I'd like to probably define this question in two parts. Carbon, there are, uh, there are two types of carbon. One is embodied carbon. That means as you build, okay, as you construct, what is the carbon that you are, you'll be emitting off when you build? And then it's operational. Then the next one will be operational carbon. As you operate the building the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what are the carbon that you'll be uh, spilling out? So there are two types of carbon that uh, uh, we look at in, in the building. Uh, a lot of effort is being used to look at operational carbon, but they forget about the embodied carbon. Um, one good example is, uh, for example, uh, Existing buildings, you have a lot of uh, green strategies that goes into the building to uh, ensure that we save utility bills, we switch off our lights, we don't use um, we use um, energy saving lights, for example, energy efficient air conditions. So a lot of effort is actually going into the operation of the building. But how do you build? Are you building productively? Are you building uh, constructively? What are, um, in terms of safety? In terms of uh, construction methodology? So a lot. And um, last one is also the materials that you're using. What sort of materials are you, is it going? Is it, is it recyclable carpets, for example? Um, so no, not many people are looking at the embodied side. Right? So I believe uh, uh, if you want, you want to look at the construction of the building in totality, you need to look at the embodied energy uh, and the embodied uh, carbon as well as the uh, operational carbon. Whether are we there or not? <coughs> I guess um, uh, for Singapore, for example. Uh, we are looking at the operational carbon quite intensively. In fact, that's part of the remark requirement. Uh, and we are making a conscious effort now to look at embodied uh, carbon. We're coming out with a carbon calculator uh, for Singapore. We are also looking at um, uh, building more productively, uh, less wastage on site, and getting um, the contractors to plan their work properly so that um, there's no, um, for example, double handling, which equates to using more fuel which equates to emitting more carbon. So um, I think the journey is uh, it will be a, a long one, but it has to be a correct one. Because once the perception is wrong about uh, about carbon, um, it can just go uh, haywire. What are, are we ever going to see a super tall building in Singapore? Because you do have a limited land area, and that would seem to make the case for building super tall. Uh, yes or no? Uh, answer will be no. Uh, there will be tall buildings in Singapore, but I guess there will be uh, certain height restrictions in um, building uh, super tall buildings as what you see in, in, in Shanghai. Uh, I would love to see that though, because it will push, put, not only push the boundaries of uh, of, of uh, engineering and architecture in, in Singapore, but it will also make use of the land uh, much more effectively. Um, I have worked on uh, tall buildings. Um, what the, the recent building that I'm, I'm working in is the uh, Capital Green Project. It's a, it's a, a green mark platinum building, but it's not as tall as what you see, like, for example, the Ching Mao. But it's, it's uh, <coughs> considered one of the uh, skyscrapers in Singapore already. What are the height restrictions? What are they the result of? Why, why are there? Oh, are <coughs> there are some uh, uh, flight paths, for example. There are also microwaves, uh, communication 
issues that's as is traveling across the, the country, and uh, basically it's also the overall master plan of the uh, how the buildings in, in town will actually look like. So as you know, um, if you see the, uh, the master planning of, uh, of of Singapore, you have the West Jurong is slightly taller buildings and goes down to the residential and then during the CBD area, at the CBD area, it goes quite tall, quite high, and then um, it drops down again at the east, and then flatter at the um, at the airport because that's the, the flight path. So there are certain restrictions because of the uh, you know uh, how big Singapore is, and also um, the economics of of, of uh, the country itself. 